you guys, today I'm outside because it's so lovely out here. And I thought I'd read to you a little what I'm working on for my English major. I know. This is The Writing Life by Annie Dillard. And obviously a very famous writer. I mean, look at that list. I've carried my copy around for so long that now it's got some water damage on it. And this video is happening outside because it's so gorgeous. And so you might hear some cars driving by or people walking around. But I just wanted to share some of this with you, if you don't mind. So here we go. When you write, you lay out a line of words. The line of words is a miner's pick, a woodcarver's gouge, a surgeon's probe. You wield it, and it digs a path you follow. Soon you find yourself deep in new territory. Is it a dead end, or have you located the real subject? You will know tomorrow or this time next year. You make the path boldly and follow it fearfully. You go where the path leads. At the end of the path, you find a box canyon. You hammer out reports, dispatch bulletins. The writing has changed in your hands. And in a twinkling, from an expression of your no notions to an epistemological tool. The new place interests you because it is not clear. You attend. In your humility, you lay down the words carefully, watching all the angles. Now the earlier writing looks soft and careless. Process is nothing. Erase your tracks. The path is not the work. I hope your tracks have grown over. I hope birds ate the crumbs. I hope you will toss it all and not look back. The line of words is a hammer. You hammer against the walls of your house. You tap the walls lightly everywhere. After giving many years attention to these things, you know what to listen for. Some of the walls are bearing walls. They have to stay or everything will fall down. Other walls can go with impunity. You can hear the difference. Unfortunately, it is often a bearing wall that has to go. It cannot be helped. There's only one solution, which appalls you, but there it is. Knock it out, duck. Courage utterly opposes the bold hope that this is such fine stuff. The work needs it or the world. Courage, exhausted, stands on the bare reality. This writing weakens the work. You must demolish the work and start over. You can save some of the sentences like bricks. It will be a miracle if you can save some of the paragraphs, no matter how excellent in themselves or hard won. You can waste a year worrying about it or you can get it over with now. Are you a woman or a mouse? The part you must jettison is not only the best written part, it is also, oddly, the part which was to have been the very point. It is the original key passage, the passage on which the rest was to hang, and from which you yourself drew the courage to begin. Henry James knew it well and said it best. In his preface to The Spoils of Boynton, he pities the writer in a comical pair of sentences that rises to a howl, which is the work in which he hasn't surrendered under dire difficulty, the best thing he meant to have kept, in which indeed, before the dreadful done, doesn't he ask himself, what has become of the thing, all for the sweet sake of which it was to proceed that extremity. So it is that a writer writes many books. In each book he intended several urgent and vivid points, many of which he sacrificed as the book's form hardened. The youth gets together his materials to build a bridge to the moon, Thoreau noted mournfully, or perchance a palace or a temple on the earth, and at length the middle-aged man concludes to build a woodshed with writer returns to these materials, these passionate subjects, as to unfinished business, for they are his life's work. 